Well, welcome back to seventh grade painting class. Uh, we're going to continue on with our watercolor project here. Uh, I hope that you're getting results uh, similar to mine at least. Um, I have been painting for some time and I realize that this may be the first time some of you have ever painted. Uh, and so as a result of that, you can't really uh, hold yourself to creating things at the exact same uh, level that I'm doing this at, although uh, it is uh, quite common for students to get very good results on these projects. Uh, so, uh, we're going to continue working on uh, parts of our painting today. I've got a few details to finish out down here at the far end of town, and then we're going to start working on uh, some gray. Uh, we're going to put some clouds in here. We're going to uh, uh, work on our street a bit, and uh, that should potentially get us through the entire uh, period today. We may have maybe two more periods. Uh, of this particular project to finish up. I'm also going to do some detail work in my stained glass window right here which seems to have been um, neglected over the last couple of sessions. So you need to make sure that your paintbrush is clean okay before we get going here and I still have I do not recommend that you set your paint kit on your painting however I know that mine is dry right now and I have a clean kit so it is organized you know from red through black so red orange yellow green blue violet and brown then black so because I have some doors way down at the very end of town there uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pick up a little bit of the brown here and periodically I will move all this out of the way. Uh, I think that should be enough brown to do the job right now. So, uh, and I also think it's important too that you need to think about shielding your work and I use an index card for that uh, so that I don't lay my hand directly on top of the paint. So I've got a little bit of brown and these tiny little doors way way down here is what I'm going to work on right now. So now my paint is not real running. When you're working at very uh, tight sizes like this, uh, you can't have a great deal of paint on the brush and you do have to stir it up so that the viscosity is quite thin. I, I mean, excuse me, thick. Uh, so what we got to do is try to keep the paint from running around in these small details as much as we can possibly do that. Now, I, if it were easy, there wouldn't be any reason to take classes, right? However, uh, this is complex work and working with the very finest point of the brush is super complex work. That, although it is far away, is recognizable as a door. Now I'm going to go ahead and just with the smallest amount of water on the tip of my brush, I'm going to pick up a little bit more of that brown and try to do the other door if I can keep this fine little point on my brush. Now you know, you've got to hold your breath a little bit when you're doing these details like this or what will happen is that, you know, even if the paint is the right consistency or viscosity, uh, you will tend to just sling it around a little bit too recklessly and that at this point in this painting would be a tragedy because we need to really uh, try to uh, get this to look like a uh, legit cartoon town there. Okay, that seems to have worked pretty good for me. Now it looks like I've got all of my doors <coughs> and uh, in all of the buildings done. So I'm going to rinse out my paintbrush, a small amount of paint that it had in it anyway, and dry it. And then I'm going to go to these windows way down here at the end of town. And it's been a couple of buildings since I see we got some yellow window here, here, uh, kind of a little bit of mixture of them here. So I am simply going to go with uh, straight up yellow in that last building. Uh, it seems uh, like the lights are on that way. So I'm going to make sure my brush is clean. And since this is very small and fine work, uh, and I'm going to be skipping it around a little bit, going to areas that I know where the painting is already dry. So when you're working with paint of any sort, uh, there's a technique or a theory called fat over lean, meaning that you should paint wet paint uh, near or next to already existing dry paint. And that goes for all kinds of paint. So when you start getting, um, mix, getting your wet paint next to other 
already wet paint, then a lot of times what you get is they infuse together because of surface tension. Now that's something from a science class, right? But it's the idea that when you put two beads of water next to each other, like on a freshly waxed car, that they will pull themselves together. So surface tension is not always uh, a good thing. Uh, when we're using watercolor in particularly, we need to take care of that as um, so that that doesn't happen if we can avoid it. Uh, if you're making flowers, for instance, then sometimes it's good to have that variegated look, meaning that the strands of colors kind of uh, bleed together a little bit. Okay, let's go to our tunnel here. Now just the inner portion of the tunnel is going to be yellow because, you know, this is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel effect that we're getting there. And that usually means seeing the light at the end of the tunnel is one of those uh, old school colloquialisms, right? Sayings or phrases. That means that you're uh, nearing the finish line of something. So uh, if the light seems very far away in the tunnel, then that means you've still got a long ways to go. If the light, on the other hand, uh, appears to be bright to you and closer, then you must be getting to the end of a process. All right, now, let's see what else we have to work on here that we could do uh, in a color. And at this point, I don't really see very much. I will have to come back. I'm going to do some detail here and here. So I look at my stained glass window here, and the goal here is to have it look like a stained glass window, which means we don't want any two colors that are the same or even close to the same uh, brilliance or value to be next to each other if we can avoid that. So in this case, I think I'm going to go to a color I haven't used much of, and that would be blue up in the upper left corner there. And we have to continuously skip around on a watercolor painting if we are going to get a quality product. So if you don't skip around, meaning you work around your painting in such a manner so that you uh, don't... Uh, how do I want to say this? So that you don't paint wet paint next to already existing wet paint. So let's see if I can see that. I'd be most happy. Okay, now. So it takes a little bit of patience. We're only working with the finest point of the brush. We want quality work more than we're interested in speed of production. Nobody has ever gotten any reward or a ward for painting fast and reckless, only for painting good. Some paintings can take years to complete. This one, though, should only take, you know, a few days at the quarter there, although we have spent a lot of time drawing and detailing this town out, and so it would be a complete shame if at this point we were to wreck it. Uh, let's see, I think I'll put some more blue right here as well. So I don't have blue touching blue that I can see, and that's what I'm attempting to achieve here. All right, so sometimes the activity speaks louder than me talking about it, so I'm just going to paint and explain myself when I think it's necessary. But I do have pretty good control with the brush, but I don't use large amounts of paint either. I'm not interested in being done fast, only in being done good. Okay, now that's a good start. Let's uh, continue a little bit of detail work. I think I will go up to my uh, pizza that I've got up here in the pizza parlor. And uh, let's see, I guess I'm going to have to kind of speckle around on that a little bit. Maybe I'll go ahead and go to some red and just put a, my little slices of pepperoni on there and I'll have to come back to that. This small work is easily ruined if you are uh, careless with it. So I'm going to shield my work here and I'm going to go around and put a little bit of just one slice of pepperoni, I suppose, in each of these slices of pizza. Probably coming out looking like a tire if I'm not careful. But with just the point of the brush Okay, now I will have to come back to that later when I know for a fact that it is dry. Okay, now having done that, we're about ready to get started on uh, using some black. And so we are going to do several things with the black. We're going to work on the smoke. 
that's coming out of some of the smokestacks. We're going to paint around the outside portion of our tunnel when that becomes dry. We're going to wash in the streets and the sidewalks. And so if we start with the lightest amount of black, and then we can make gray. When we put black against something such as a uh, white surface, then what we notice is that it grays it. It kind of counteracts that white surface a little bit. So now I, right here, have got a small bowl that we would use in the physical classroom. And of course, I've got my cup of rinse water as well. So I'm going to transfer just a little bit of that water into the bowl. Now as you can see on this tiny little mixing bowl, there's like a ring around it right there where people traditionally over the years have filled this mixing bowl up. And uh, you don't really need a lot of water. In fact, the more that you use, the more difficult it becomes. Now you should not do this over top of your painting. I'm pretty confident. So I'm going to go ahead and pour in some water until it gets up to that little ring that's been formed by years of use and as you tilt it it shouldn't be any more than that okay this is, it gets very difficult to fix your water that way so now I'm going to set it up here off screen and I'm going to go to make sure that my paintbrush is clean and when we're done using the black paint you're going to have to be very 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 careful to uh, make sure that your brush is cleaned out when we go to some regular colors. So what we got to do here, here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to put an index card onto the painting right now and you can see what I am doing this way. And I'm going to put my water bowl in there so that you can see what I'm doing. You should not do this yourself on top of your painting. But because this is an instructional video, I have to take some liberties with it. So what we've got to do is go to our black paint and we're going to stir it up so it's pretty strong. Okay, and then we're going to transfer it uh, just on the brush. So if you get the brush, you know, with a lot of black paint on it like you see right now, then we can put that into our water. And this black water, the more paint we put into the water, the more opaque it will become. Uh, so I'm going to go with, I think, like uh, maybe two good servings here. Now, don't get your black paint cell here too soupy, uh, or you will really, 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 really struggle uh, with this because you'll have black paint running all over the place. Now, here's what we're going to do next. We're going to test this on an index card because what we want is kind of a light gray color. So we put it onto our index card or a scrap piece of paper, and we let it sit there for a minute. See how it's kind of a puddle right now? Uh, and we're going to kind of work it into the, the paper a little bit there, but not too aggressively. Okay, so then we should, when it sits there for a minute, we can take a paper towel and soak it up. And what we notice is it's left us a gray stain behind. Now that's going to be really useful when we get ready to start painting in clouds and the road. And eventually we will use this water uh, this wash, and this is about the color we're looking for right now, kind of a concrete gray color. We're going to use that in order to be able to paint in uh, areas that we want to look gray. And when we put this black water onto a white surface, it will lighten it up even more. So I'm going to make sure that my paintbrush is clean right now because it's got residue from the black paint cell in it. All right, now. You should not leave this on your painting. However, I'm making an instructional video. You should have this off to the side somewhere. But I am going to start out by uh, working on this smoke and these clouds and this smoke in here. And we're simply just going to pick up this, this black water and we're going to start maybe over here with this smoke okay, that's coming out. Now, if you're not getting a good gray color, you can always go back and add a little bit more black to it. And that's what we're going to be doing anyway here in a minute when we get to the road, because we want the road to be a little bit darker than other areas of this. But we don't want it to be jet black. If you were to look carefully at <coughs> concrete and pavement, you'll notice that they're not really, really as black as people tend to make them. You all tend to young students tend to really, really overwork the black color in their paintings. And then what that does is it really makes your painting less colorful because black just soaks up all of that light energy and causes it to not look so good. 
um, and it deadens the colors near it. So I'm going to go ahead and find a place to I want to work on this one next. So you just got to be careful to keep your hands off of your painting. Turn your painting upside down if you need to. You've got that freedom. Because I'm making this video, I have to be able to, you have to be able to see what I'm doing. And so it would be impractical for me to turn my painting upside down when you all are looking at what I'm trying to do. So I simply have to walk around my painting surface because I'm standing at a, a workstation here in the physical classroom. Now, people are like, Mr. Mathis, this is just gray water. And it is showing up a little bit weak there, but that's okay because I can always go back over it again with a little bit more black water. Uh, you will also find that periodically you have got to stir your black water up because all of the residue, all the pigment, the colored part of your paint uh, is heavier than the water and it tends to sink to the bottom of, the, of this little mixing bowl we've got going here. So I'm just going to keep working around here with my gray. And if it's not gray enough, I may just have to add a little bit more black to my water here. So when we're using a thin coat of paint, that's the technique that we referred to in our notes as wash. A wash is a thin watery coat of paint. And it really can, uh, you can do a lot of good with just, you know, black water here. Uh, and I'm simply, it does look gray to me. Well, okay, it's looking gray on the projection screen as well, and that's a good thing. So you just got to keep kind of building it up a little bit at a time. If you try to rush through a painting, you're just going to make a mess. Now, there are people who are professional artists that paint rather quickly, but they have done a lot of preparatory work before they started these paintings. And a lot of times that's more of a performance than it is actually a painting that they're making. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can put the pain in painting if you're not real careful here. And I want you to enjoy painting, but it's also a learning exercise as well. So, when you painted many years, a lot of what I'm saying will make perfect sense to you. When you were young, you, uh, students who are young have a tendency to want to work fast for some reason. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but I think it's got something to do with just our society. We want everything done very quickly in our society. We're a very impatient society. S and, you know, some artworks can take years to create. So, this is not one of those artworks, but we still want to get good results. We're not interested in being done so much fast as we're interested in being done good. Alright, so that cloud is starting to look, at least to my visual sense, my eyes, is starting to look pretty gray. So maybe I'll go back and retouch it a few more times. But So just the black water does a great deal for your painting. Uh, and as, the, as it dries, you can just retouch it a bit and you're going to notice that you get variegation. A real cloud doesn't look like it is cut out of construction paper and glued onto your painting. It looks like it was uh, a real cloud has a variety of variegated tones in it, meaning that they kind of strand themselves together and one part of the cloud is darker than another part of the cloud. And one part of the cloud is lit up. So most of the time the lightest portion of the cloud, of course, would be at the top of it, whereas the darkest portion of the cloud would be at the bottom of it because the sun is being blocked out by the cloud itself. The water vapor in the cloud absorbs the light, thus making the bottom of the cloud appear to be darker. So it's, uh, it's all starting to work for me here. And I'm a patient person, so uh, it's not a chore for me to work slow and good. Although you all may be thinking I work really, really quickly, but I feel like I'm taking my time. And I've been painting for many years, and so what seems easy to one person is many times very complicated for other people. Now that is starting to look like a cloud. On the projection screen here I can see where those light portions are at above it, and it's slightly darker as it uh, transitions to the lower portion. So I'm pretty happy with that. So let's go ahead and move over there to the uh, U.S. Army Engineers building that's got some smoke coming out of it for some reason. Probably that, that uh, piece of heavy equipment that's up in there is affecting it somewhat. 
So I'm going to test my color a little bit. Ooh, not that. That's the color I'm looking for there. Okay, here we go. Let's see what I can do with this cloud over here coming out of the U.S. Army Engineer Building. And here we go. Oh, I got it a little bit too dark. I'm going to have to get rinse out a little bit before it sets up. These things happen, but you can't be panicking when these things happen. Okay, that's that's going to be a little better. So I'm going to work through this kind of carefully, trying to strand it all out a little bit so I get natural looking smoke and natural looking clouds. Yeah, now, I've gotten a little bit of water. This has gotten a little bit runnier than I had expected, but it's still going to work if you just move that little puddle around with the very finest tip of the brush you're going to notice you get control. Uh, since we're painting next to already existing dry material, there's no uh, danger of uh, the surface tension pulling this into another portion of the painting. And if we could look at the painting, <clears throat> strangely, on a microscopic level, uh, you would notice that where you have already painted stuff in, that is a little bit higher. It, it's pronounced above the surface of the of the paper we're working on a little bit and so it does tend to act as a a little bit of a like a dam and it holds it back a little bit like a levee would and uh, so when you don't have that dry paint yet it just tends to just slide right into the next shape because there's nothing to stop it from doing that now I'm going to look at the projection screen that is looking like some smoke now ladies and gentlemen so I'm going to keep working on it there so I get a, a good image that makes some sense visually to the people that have to stare at this thing. All right, now we're getting somewhere. All right, so just the finest touches with the tiniest part of the paintbrush. We're making good progress here. So let me step back and see what I've made. I'll tell you what, that one portion up there is just giving me fits. It would be on this part right here and that might be, I see on the projection screen, that is merely a reflection right there. But I'm going to try to deaden that a bit. It is gray, but on the projection screen it appears to be white because it's shining off of that light, but I'll bet when it dries it won't look like that. So I'm still going to keep have to keep working on that a little bit to get it to soak up that light. And I'm going to have some level of faith that it will do that. Uh, if I keep messing with it, there's a good possibility that I will overwork this. I can always wait for it to dry and then go back and manipulate the paint a little bit more at that time. All right, so we're getting somewhere. This is starting to look like uh, smoke and cloudage, and it's definitely not white anymore. Okay, now let me step back and remove this and see where we're at with all of this. And so progress is being made so far, and we've got a good 10 minutes of class time left, so we can go ahead and start doing some other work. Now, uh, the biggest portion of this, and I have a theory that says, you know, you should probably work from the largest portions to the smaller portions. And uh, I think that this, what we should start with is, let's go with the top surface of the sidewalks only. And I'll bet we can continue to use the black water that we've already got prepared. So I'm going to start, I'm going to shield my drawing, or my painting here, and I'm going to have, you should not lay this up on your painting. However, I'm feeling pretty confident, although now that I've said that, I'm starting to worry. And we're simply going to paint in only the tread of the sidewalk. That means the surface we walk on, the upper surface, not the edge, not the curb. So only the surface we walk on. And, uh, you know, you can paint a little bit freer <coughs> when you don't have so many complex and small details to work around. As you can see, I'm getting a pretty good gray color right now. And this is showing up rather nicely on the projection screen, which I'm hoping 
translates to the video that we're watching here. So I'm painting toward the bottom of the painting right now so that I can paint a little more freely <coughs> and if I you know get some of the black water runs off onto the bottom of the painting well nothing is uh, nothing has been hurt okay so in this particular case I'm getting good control I'm getting a nice sharp line right where these surfaces meet and I look at it and it looks like concrete if you ask this old man so I'm going to continue doing this now although I've got mine <coughs> my water uh, bowl here uh, on top of a index card on top of my painting I would not recommend that for you all uh, since you have probably a little bit more space to work in and I'm thinking you're not making a instructional video either so I have to be able to show you what I'm doing even though I'm violating my own clean working habits theories. Uh, now I will say this, when I'm making paintings of my own, I would never put my rinse water on top of my painting or my paint thinner if I was working with oil-based paint. Now as you can see, I'm not painting anything except the extreme top surface of the sidewalk. Uh, if you paint the sides of the sidewalk in, what happens are these edges, uh, what happens is that you're painting all looks flat then. It loses that three-dimensional illusion that we've worked so hard over these weeks to create. So you have to exercise some control so that you don't lose the the uh, familiarity of the painting. People know what they're looking at if you give them all these three-dimensional clues. But if you do not, if you paint over those, then you obscure those three-dimensional clues or cues and then it's very difficult for people to understand what it is they are seeing. One of the uh, <clears throat> reasons people will say to young students on a regular basis, especially little children, uh, what is this? Or, because the kid knows what it is, but there is so little sophistication in the way that they drew or painted it that it doesn't mean anything to the casual observer. It's very difficult to understand what, you know, the person that makes it knows what their artistic intent is. The person that has to look at it doesn't know that yet. And so we have to help our viewers comprehend what we are doing. And we do that through visual clues, visual cues. And those visual cues are things like making sure that the top of the sidewalk the curb and the road, even though they are all going to be grayish colors, and blacks are all slightly different variations. Okay, let's step away from this and see what's happening. I see gray beginning to appear. So I'm going to work my way down the other sidewalk and do my best to get that finished up and uh, then move on to something else here before our session ends. So let me, now I'm going to have to work, it's going to be risky now, so I'm going to just have to work free handed I suppose, with my water bowl in my hand, my mixing bowl as I call it. So you might have noticed that everything that we did in the notes is starting now to show up in our project and that's the way I try to do everything that we have to make in art class is to show you that there is a rationale behind uh, the notes and the information that you gain by taking notes and then this is the application aspect of that I'll tell you what we're still running bells around this house in here even though it's been a while so this uh, remote learning has uh, still got bells and uh, you all are still expected to be in classes on time. I don't give my remote students or my distance learning students much time to get into the classroom. I usually start without them if they're not there within three minutes. Sometimes I've had people drop in after like 14 minutes and that's not good either. All right. Okay, so I'm trying to uh, work fast but accurately here. 
Now, I don't know what this is all about. It's got this line in the middle of it, but we'll just let it go. We're going to, like it's a sidewalk, a control joint, uh, where if the sidewalk does crack, it cracks at the control joints rather than uh, wherever it just feels like it at. And that looks more attractive and functions better when you do that. It's something I learned when I was in the Army Engineers. Strangely, we placed a lot of concrete back then. Now, in my next sidewalk that's just beyond the van here that's pulling out into the street from the alleyway, I've got one of those little uh, magnetic uh, pads that when you walk across them, it uh, causes the doors to open. So I'm going to carefully paint around that when I get there. So I'm constantly, when I make paintings and make artwork, I'm always trying to think one step ahead of what I'm doing. I'm focusing on what I'm doing, but at the same time I'm looking ahead as to what my next task will be. Because as many times the paint will dry out on you before you get a chance to even put it on a painting many times. And I think that's why uh, fine artists prefer to use oil paint. That is really not going to happen with oil paint. Oil paint dries so slowly that you're in no danger of it drying out before you run out. The problem with uh, oil paint is sometimes you only make enough of one color up and then you still need more of it. And it's very difficult to match that color when you remix. So on the one hand, you have to mix up enough so that you can make sure you finish the area you're working in. But then on the other hand, you don't want to mix up so much of it that you end up uh, wasting paint in the end. So painters are uptight people about a lot of things, wasting paint and uh, leaving paint unused uh, when you've been making a painting, that drives this particular painter crazy. And of course I have tubes and tubes of unused paint because I know, you know, even though I may never use them, but in my mind it seems like I know that I'm going to need that paint at some point in time and so it's hard for me to throw it out even though there's maybe just a little bit of it left in the paint tube. So, and in my classroom you'll notice I've got paint bottles all turned upside down because I, it's hard for me to throw that paint away even though there may only be enough in it to paint something the size of an index card. But it's hard for art teachers sometimes when you don't you struggle to get materials and you do get them it's kinda hard when you're an art teacher not to try to stretch them out as far as you can make them go okay so my wash work here is looking pretty good I'm pretty satisfied with it so let me step back and see so I'm getting a nice good gray concrete color and let's finish this out all the way down at the end of the street here and then might have worked ourselves into a bit of a dead end for today, but there's still some detail work could be touched up in here. So I've got the tops of my sidewalks are all gray, just like the tops of the clouds are gray, are lit, meaning they are a lighter color. Ooh, there's our dinger for the day, indicating that we're pretty much out of time here. So let's see what we've got there. I've got a gray sidewalk I may go ahead right now with what little bit of time is remaining in class and paint this ring in this outer portion of the tunnel uh, the head wall as it's called so I'm simply going to go back to my paint kit and I'm going to pick up some strong black paint and if your brush is still wet from the black water we've been using then that's good too because we want this paint to not be runny at all we want this paint to be very um, dense and controllable because this is going to content you can really mess up here now we do know though that our yellow in the middle should be dry by now so and I'm only using the finest point of the brush in order to get this detail work I'm going to go this way now painting backhand now painting backhanded means that you can't see the side of the brush that's putting the color down and that can be tricky so it's an acquired skill you have to know your material and equipment and uh, I think I've got my black paint there maybe a little bit too runny but it's starting to dry even as I'm speaking ok 
Okay, let's get that last little detail right there and then trim around this a little bit more and bring it all the way down. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to turn myself this way a bit and continue carefully painting this portion. Okay, and there's just that last little scrap right there. Gotta be careful. Hold your breath. <gasps> All right, I think that that's going to be fine for right now. So I think I'm just going to stop with that. And yes, I'm going to stop with it. <clears throat> I can always touch it up a little bit later when I come back to this project. And then I think that's about all we're going to have time for today. This session has gone on for about 40 minutes it looks like. <clears throat> so we're going to call it a session today and it looks like we've made tremendous progress and uh, we've got clouds so we've done some here let's review quickly uh, we started out by painting in a little bit of a cloud of smoke coming out of my pizza parlor doing a few details in the pizza some panes in my little window right there and the doors and then our larger cloud right there the smoke coming out of the building uh, we mixed up some black water for that and then we did the sidewalks and this kind of concrete gray black water wash technique and then we finished up today by simply uh, very carefully trimming around the yellow that we painted in at the very beginning of all of this so I've been pretty happy I don't have a lot of my paint running around and, and polluting other colors and so I'm pretty satisfied with my progress today and if you've kept up with this and you're getting good results you should be proud of your progress as well so that's all we're going to do for today and I will talk with you in the very next session you have a nice day thanks bye